Good evening. I'm Philip Bahar, and I'm the executive director of the Chicago Humanities Festival, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for a conversation with Chris Jones and Lin-Manuel Miranda. A little bit of housekeeping. If you have any phones or devices that beep, please do turn it off because we are documenting tonight's conversation. And if you don't have the Hamilton book by Miranda and Jeremy McCarter or the Ron Chernow biography, Unabridged Books will be selling them in the lobby afterwards. Um, a few thanks. First, I want to thank the Chicago Tribune for partnering us with us on the event tonight. 26 years ago, the Humanities Festival's very first program was with the great playwright Arthur Miller, and the Tribune was with us at that time. 26 years later, 26 years later, we're, we're with the artist who is really transforming theater today, and we're just thrilled to have this partnership. Um, I want to thank the Lyric Opera for giving us this spectacular house tonight. They're, they're rehearsing for Das Rheingold, which opens next week, so getting it to the house tonight is really greatly appreciated. I want to thank the underwriters for the program tonight, Lori and Jim Bay. They are passionate about the Lyric Opera. They are passionate about theater, and they're passionate about the Humanities Festival. So Jim and Lori, thank you so much for all you do. And a special thanks to all of you in the audience who are Chicago Humanities Festival supporters or members. This entire house is filled with Humanities Festival members and Chicago Tribune subscribers. And you're the reason we bring great art, culture, and ideas both to the stage and to print. So thank you. You're the reason we're here and we're thrilled to be part of your night. <laughs> At the Humanities Festival, we really believe that humanity thrives when people connect, have open conversations, and open themselves up to ideas that go beyond themselves. And certainly tonight, I know that all of you are here to connect with the people you're with, to connect with Chris and Lin-Manuel on stage, and maybe even to meet someone next door to you who is going to become a long friend. Um, you come here to learn something new and to walk away transformed. So we hope that between October 29th and November 12th, you join us for the 100 plus other programs that we're going to be doing as part of our fall festival. We have Philip Glass, the great composer, coming, Maureen Dowd from the New York Times, Trevor Noah from The Daily Show, and Melissa Harris Perry, the political correspondent. So we have a great, great lineup for you. You can download our app and see everything that's coming up. And on your way out, you'll also get a summary of some of the other programs. So thank you, thank you for coming out tonight. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Bruce Stold, our partner, the editor, and the publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, everybody. Man, what a crowd. You'd think Hamilton was opening tonight. <laughs> All right, I gotta ask, how many of you have already got tickets for Hamilton? All right, all you with your hands up, you know that you got to be really careful around the people that don't have their hands up. <laughs> Do you have something they really want? You know, Hamilton is that the transformative musical starts uh, performances on September 27th in Chicago, and we hope it stays here forever. You know the... <laughs> Let's see if he's... I think they're listening. You know the amazing career of its creator, the Tonys, the Grammys, the Pulitzer Prize, the Genius Grant from uh, Chicago's MacArthur Foundation. Lincoln Park Zoo named one of its new baby residents, Alexander Camelton. <laughs> and Lin-Manuel Miranda, the subject of all this acclaim, is only 36. The fact that Chicago is the first stop and what will be the Hamilton World Tour says a great deal about him and about our city, too. Last night on uh, TV, he called Chicago the best theater town in the U.S. <laughs> You're not going to get an argument in this crowd. The Chicago Tribune has covered Chicago for, for 170 years. It's art, it's culture, it's, uh, it's sports. We were around the last time the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. <laughs> Just saying. 
Uh, we continue to cover this rich city with energy and thoughtfulness and, and a great deal of pride. So I'd like to thank the Humanities Festival for our long and, and successful partnership, and I'd like to thank you for your support for the Tribune. Tonight, Mr. Miranda will be in conversation with the Tribune's Chris Jones, one of the most influential theater critics in the country and also one of the most delightful people I know. Chris earlier this year won the George Jean Nathan Award, the theater world's highest honor for drama criticism, and he's written extensively about the impact and the importance of Hamilton. There's nobody better to do this conversation than Chris Jones. I know if you're here tonight, you're a fan of his. Mr. Miranda has a friend in the audience, Jeremy McCarter, his co-author of the, the magnificent book, Hamilton, the Revolution. If you missed Rick Kogan's uh, wonderful piece on Jeremy McCarter last Sunday, you should uh, find it online. In that piece, Mr. McCarter calls Mr. Miranda the busiest man in the world. And there's no doubt that's true, and it makes it all the more special that he's here, uh, that he gave us time to be here with us tonight. Please give him a real Chicago welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Jones and Lynn manuel Miranda. <laughs> Feeling alone? I am indeed. <laughs> uh, I love you! <laughs> so I want to thank you. It's the, it's the first and the last time in my life I'll ever be on StubHub. And I, I appreciate <laughs> that. And then my kid, uh, Evan, he's, he, one time we're, we're in the car together, uh, I guess the morning before last, and he said to me, I dream Lin Manuel Miranda came to mom's book group last night well, you were out at the show, and you're always at a show. And I said, that's cool. And then he said, and then she left you for him. <laughs> and on that note? On that note, we begin our conversation. <laughs> All right, so let us just ponder for a sec. So this, this time is convenient for nobody. These tickets were a pain in the neck to get. Everyone risked, right? You risk rush hour traffic to get here. Um, these tickets sold out in 10 minutes flat. It's just two guys, really one guy, with a microphone. <laughs> and yet here everybody is. So how are you doing with all of that, Lin-Manuel? Pretty good. Um, <laughs> you know, it's... It's... <laughs> it's <totally good. laughs> This feels like that very special episode of Family Ties where Michael J. Fox is just talking to a black space. <laughs> and it's just very special and two-party and intense. Um, I, you know, I'm an open book. I wore my Sunday in the park with George socks. I'm gonna take my, so my shoes off because I tell the truth more when my shoes are off. Let's do this. <laughs> Well, I mean, you're a pretty, you know, you're a pretty powerful guy. You've got now, you, you've got a kid, and creativity comes out of struggle sometimes. You're at the point now where you can say, you know, I've got a musical idea. I could do, you know, a Chris Christie musical, and everybody would go, great. It's the next Hamilton. But you know the problem with that? He'd hold up traffic so you couldn't get here in time. <laughs> that would play huge in New York. <laughs> He'd close the bridge. <laughs> But it's true that when you did Hamilton, you came out every day into the lobby of the public theater. And then in the last days of Hamilton on Broadway, when people were sort of frantic because you were leaving, I mean, it must have been a change for you, right? You're a genial fellow. You can't do what you used to be able to do, right? Yeah, it was, it was, um, it was intense towards that last month. Um, it was, uh, 
I think people felt the crush of time. They felt like, oh my God, original cast, we have to get a selfie, a moment, um, a piece of this before it's gone. Um, and fans were lovely. The fans have remained lovely throughout, but when you set up a barricade, it sets up a different thing. It became very unsafe for me to leave through the stage door. I'd have little kids in the front, and even if I said, please don't rush, please don't rush, please don't rush, I'd see those kids get crushed. Um, so I ended up escaping through Shuffle Along's theater uh, on 45th Street for the last month of the run, um, and having security there take me to the, I mean, it got really crazy, and not because of fans, but because of autograph mercenaries, um, who I knew were making a living off of me signing the playbill and then se selling that playbill on, on eBay, so the mercenaries kind of messed it up for everyone else. So when, when Alexander Hamilton, the subject of this little musical that's got a lot of attention around here, so when he was 10, his father basically walked out on him, right? Yeah. When he was 12, his mother died of a fever in the bed right next to him. He was adopted by his cousin, who then killed himself. And I think during that same year, like the same couple of years, like his aunt, his uncle, his grandmother also died. Yes. And essentially, he, he got all of his possessions seized, and then he became an orphan. So he's a teenager, and he's an orphan, and he's desolate. And in a matter of it feels like weeks or months, he was one of the founding fathers. So what do you, what do you see in that story? I mean, how did he possibly pull that off? Um, I think the, the moment I realized this thing was a musical uh, was towards the end of the second chapter, Ron Chernow posts one of the first writings we have of Hamilton. He's about 14 years old. All of what you've listed has already happened. And he writes a letter to his friend Ned Stevens. And he says, um, and I'm paraphrasing because it's been a while since I read it, um, I may be said to be building castles in the air, um, and I, I hope you won't think less of me, but we have seen such schemes successful when the projector is constant. I shall conclude by saying that I wish there was a war. Um, and that's, that's the best musical theater character you can hope for. Um, that's, that's Molly Brown saying, I don't believe in down, I'm going up. That's Pippin saying, I want my corner of the sky. That's uh, Tony saying, um, you know, something's coming. Um, it's that drive, that irrepressible drive. We have seen such schemes successful when the projector is constant. Um, that kind of idealism. Say that again. We have seen. We have seen such schemes, the life he imagines for himself, successful right. when the projector of that him. fantasy is constant. So I'm not going to stop until I get the thing I'm imagining in my head. And then what undercuts it is the next sentence, I shall conclude by saying that I wish there was a war, um, which is the most adolescent thing ever written. <laughs> it's also, um, but it's also, it also speaks to his awareness of his situation. He's broke and he's from nowhere. And the only way to rise when you're in that position is through military glory. So he's also showing intense smarts and cynicism about where he is. Um, so I was like, I know this guy. I want to ride with this guy, and I want to see what happens. So he died too early to prevent other people from trashing his reputation, including Thomas Jefferson. Right? Well, he has succeeded... Um, the next four presidents do not have a ton of love for Hamilton, right? There's Adams, who he wrote a screed against while he was in office. Um, then comes Jefferson, his best friend said no one ever. Um, <laughs> then Madison, his other best friend, who actually was friends with him for a time, but then sort of um, fell into political disagreements with him. Then John Quincy Adams, the son of the guy he talks smack about. Um, so that's... That's four people in charge of the country uh, who, um, who don't want to see this guy um, remembered well. So um, it's not a, you know, it, it, it drives home the lesson, which is it's not even about what you do in your life. It's about who survives you. Um, and you can have done incredible things in your life and career, um, but if those who survive you don't tell your story, it's like it never happened. So how do you ensure that those who survive you tell your story? Or can you not worry about it? 
you can't worry about it. I, 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 I can't worry about it. I don't think you can either. You will have your writings. Right. You will have your incredible reviews. You will have um, the things you've done. Um, and, you know, the, the, the takeaway, you know, we end Hamilton with Hamilton's extraordinary wife, Eliza, who lives another half century, um, who does incredible things in her own right and dedicates herself to, to his legacy. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's even more tragic in real life. She's pushing her kids to write the definitive biography on her husband. She passes away before that project is done. So she never lives to see that happen. Uh, one of her sons does eventually write the biography, but she doesn't live to see it. Um, so um, we also are survived by the people who love us and tell stories about us and, and keep our, our love alive. I think about it every time I um, see one of Roger Ebert's wife's tweets. Um, I am, yeah. <laughs> I was, I, I was a film nerd before I was a theater nerd, and I would read the entire book, uh, the entire book of reviews every year when it was updated every year. I could, I could recite his no-star review of North by Rob Reiner, which is one of the best written <laughs> destructions of a movie I've ever read. Um, and, and that's how we are survived, by the people who love us and, and tell our stories. I think when you watch Hamilton, though, you get this sense. I don't know how you were all feeling when you were, like, in traffic or whatever, or on the train on the way down here. You sometimes, we all sometimes wonder, we have a finite amount of time, and we don't know how long that amount of time is. And some people, including you, I might add, seem incredibly good at packing in a lot of things. And Hamilton, too, right? It, it's sort of, he's almost like um, the model of how to do a lot quickly. And really, if you don't know when you're going to die, it makes sense that you would do a lot quickly, right? Yeah. And by the way, we all don't know when we're going to die. So <laughs> it becomes about how do you respond to that news? How often are you aware of that fact? Um, and I think Hamilton and Burr were both people who were acutely aware of it and responded to it in different ways. And so in constructing their relationship, we look to models, but there isn't really one. It's not... Valjean and Javert. It's not a pursuer and a pursued. It's not Salieri and Mozart, because they're equally brilliant men. It's not one envious of the other's genius. It's one envious of the other's temperament. You can't change your temperament. Um, I feel like I've been Burr in life in terms of temperament as often as I've been Meaning Hamilton. what? Well, how would you describe your temperament? Meaning I'm on year one of writing Hamilton, and I'm watching colleagues win Tonys and win awards, and I'm just starting my next project. And you have to go, well, I'm alive, I'm breathing air another day, I'm just gonna get as much writing done as today as I can, and, and waiting for it, and basically waiting for the right opportunity for things to happen. And, and I think we're all a mix of both, right? Hamilton doesn't wait for anything. Um, Hamilton is like, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. And Burr's like, wait, I wanna reserve the right to change my mind if shit goes sideways. <laughs> Um, one of the biggest sort of history what-ifs I wrote into the show, um, and it was interesting because, uh, you know, I was always working with Ron Chernow and sending him what I wrote, and some of the stuff um, he, he'd write back right away, no, that's not how it happened, and some of the stuff he didn't bat an eye at, and it's, um, it's a scene in Nonstop where Hamilton invites Burr to help him write the Federalist Papers. That never happened. Um, Hamilton did consult other people who didn't participate, Governor Morris uh, being one among them. Um, but I wrote that because I, wanted, I needed to underline the point of they're coming up at the same time, they're both lawyers, they're both in similar positions in society, but one goes out on a limb and writes this thing to help uh, convince people that the Constitution's the best way to do things, and one is like, no, we don't know that this is going to work. Um, I'll be over here. Good luck to you. Um, and so that, that, was a, that, that historical what-if was sort of a great way to underline your differences prior to the end of the act. You famously say sometimes that you get your best ideas on vacation, right? Yeah. You got your idea for Hamilton while you were on vacation from In the Heights, right? Yes. So what kind of vacations do you have? You lie on the beach and you go, <laughs> where's <laughs> Where's my, how do we get that kind of vacation? Well, huh? if you're looking for your next project on vacation, you're not really on vacation, right? That's, right? Right. <laughs> that's the catch 22 of it. You have to really unplug. And um, that's very hard. It's hard for me to do. As, as my Twitter followers can tell you, I'll be like, I'm never coming back. And then the next day, 
but here's like a thing, here's like a cat with a camel and it's really cute. <laughs> I couldn't resist sharing this with you. Okay, so do you, get, do, do you think Twitter helps your big, like, okay, most of us, we have little bits of creativity, a really good tweet, and then we have big bits of creativity, Hamilton. Some people would say you get sucked into the tweets, young people, maybe, you might say, think this, you get sucked into the tweets, you're never gonna write Hamilton. Yeah. You seem to do both. So how do you do that? <laughs> well, honestly, this is gonna sound Honesty's so crazy. Um, they're opposing muscle groups. What, say it again? They're opposing muscle groups. I, <laughs> I write things that I know are gonna take years to finish. I, I started writing Hamilton in 2008, and it's in Chicago here in 2016. Um, so, uh, the opposing muscle group, while I still haven't figured out what Jefferson is going to say to Hamilton in that battle is, let me write some things over here to my friends. I found that Twitter was a really nice substitute for caffeine over the course of writing <laughs> Hamilton. Um, there are people in this audience who were probably with me while I was saying, okay, I'm going to be up all night writing this Jefferson section and, uh, you know, send me cat videos while I work this out. And, you know, getting a response from the world is like a little shot of dopamine. Um, you know, for those of us who are addicted to being on stages and getting applause, it's like a low-level methadone um, <laughs> of just a, a, like an audience whenever you want in your pocket. Are you in fact addicted to being on stage again? I mean, could you walk away from all this and be happy? Yeah, but I, you know, Wait, I... You said yes? Uh, I, <laughs> I said yes, but. It's a but. big question. It's a big question. It's the opposite of Second City. I didn't say yes and. I said yes, but. <laughs> um, you need both. Again, back to opposing muscle groups. Yes. Um, I, I, I feel filled up when I get to perform Hamilton. Hamilton is a 14-course meal of a role. Um, I don't think I'm done with the role, although I'm certainly done with it for now. <laughs> Right, I'll be back. Um, when there was all the hoopla over me leaving, I just kept flash forwarding to like, you know, me being Ted Neely or Yul Brynner and like people being like, oh my God, he's doing it again. <laughs> he's back as Hamilton in the 19th national tour. Because I, I, I watch the show and as much as I, I love watching it and as much as I'm proud of it, I, there's a part of me that wants to be on stage with it always. That doesn't go away. So you grew up on the northern tip of Manhattan, yeah. right, in Inwood, and there's that line in In the Heights, which is always my favorite line, which is, uh, I think it's Nina, right, when she says, I, I thought I lived at the top of the world, I'm paraphrasing, to the author, when the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I know how it goes. <laughs> Just covering myself for yeah. a sec. Uh, I thought I lived at the top of the world when my, when my world was a subway line. What Did was, you... Yeah, it was a subway map, yeah. Thank right. you, subway map. Yeah. Um, is that how you felt? That's how I felt. Uh, my world was prescribed by the New York City subway map. And there used to be a little um, arrow in the corner. It was a reverse arrow that looked like a black Pac-Man. And I used to pretend that the Pac-Man was eating um, train lines. And local, local were regular. And then like express lines that were the white circle were power pellets. Um, that was my, my map of the world. And we lived at the top of it. Um, particularly in the old maps where the Bronx was not as sharply defined as it is now, uh, which was above us. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a very autobiographical line. And it's, 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 I always, every time I see In the Heights, I've seen it a lot of times, as you can imagine, the, I always wonder where you are in that show, and I think, okay, well, he's partly, he's partly um, Nina, he's partly Usnavi. Where, you know, where, where, where is he in the show? Are you, I'm guessing you're all over that show, right? Kiara and I are all of them. We are all of them, and it, it really is a love letter to um, our families and our neighborhoods growing up. She, North Philly, me, Northern Manhattan. And, um, and there's also, I mean, there's love letters, literal love letters to our family. Like, there's a line about my um, kuka came into the salon. You know, Kiara has an aunt kuka. Um, the, the main characters, Kevin, Camila, and Daniela, are the names of my three cousins who live in Puerto Rico. Um, so it was a love letter to our families. But in terms of um, where we find ourselves, um, we are all over it. Um, Kiara, in many ways, was a ringleader growing up. And she would hold readings and Latino poet 
readings in the bookshops in northern Philly, and I'm just as much a Nina as she is an Usanavi. Um, you know, I, I, I went to school uh, in the richest zip code in the country on the Upper East Side, but I spoke Spanish at home, and all my friends in the neighborhood spoke Spanish. Um, and I remember that drift. I remember feeling like I was drifting away from my neighborhood, even as I lived in it, um, as I sort of assimilated more in the culture of my school. And you still live in that neighborhood? Yeah, I live, well, I moved all the way downtown to 180s and do you uh, from 200th Street. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about that question now? If you were feeling that when you were riding in the Heights, I mean, I remember you then. We, we met a few times when you were not like this. <laughs> so it must be more acute now, that feeling of drifting away from your neighborhood. No, I actually, on the contrary, I feel like... Um, my neighborhood is sort of the last place where people still kind of knew me when, and um, I, I can mark the passage of time by seeing the kids who grew up there with their kids. Um, that's like a real world experience uh, that I wouldn't trade for the world. I mean, I wrote a whole show about how I don't want to leave uh, my neighborhood, and, um, and so I love that. You know, one of the, one of the best moments I ever had was, I remember um, my, my dog was still a puppy, this is like 2011, and I, was, I had to go into a store, but the store didn't allow dogs, and I was struggling with tying her up because she was a puppy and really ornery, and this construction dude who was sitting on the curb outside said, relax with Snobby, I'll hold her till you get back. <laughs> <laughs> And that was like, oh my God, this is what I've always wanted. Um, <laughs> just like the guy on the corner saying, Usnavi, it's cool, I'll hold your dog till you get back. Success. And that is success, <laughs> and that is, that is all I've ever wanted out of fame. Everything else has been extra. So all you've ever wanted out of fame is a construction worker to hold your puppy, it's and just you're good. It's like being known in the neighborhood and being able to say The royalty is not all of that, we don't care about yeah. that. It's all about the construction worker. Yeah. While you were living there, you would spend a week in the summer right in Puerto Rico with your grandparents. Is that a month? Yeah. Okay. What was that like? So you went from, as a young person, you went from Manhattan to that. Yeah. So what was that like? What were the sense <laughs> memories? Like, what, what, what happened to you when you landed on the island? It's an excellent recipe for making a writer. Um, if, you make, if you make your kid just a little out of place everywhere he goes, um, <laughs> it's a great way to become a writer because... I was the kid who went to the fancy school in my neighborhood. I was the own, one of the only Puerto Rican kids in my class at school. And then I'd get sent to Puerto Rico where I was the like gringo with the like whack job Spanish accent. Um, <laughs> You know, who's, you know, my accent was... Did they actually say that when you came walking well, they down would the street? Just say, like, <laughs> kids my age would be like, you talk weird, we're going this way. Um, and so my friends, and I think this is why Abuela is such a prominent character in the show, all of my friends were my grandparents' friends. Um, they, were, they were the viejitas who made limbel and, and would take care of me and watch shows with me. Um, I couldn't make friends my age in Puerto Rico. And so um, the, the other thing that's... But... but um, I also had such a profound connection to the island. I think when you grow up in New York, you see the roles prescribed for Latinos both on stage and in movies and in real life as we are the janitors, we are the nannies, we are the ones who take care of you um, and do the jobs no one else wants to do. And then you go to Puerto Rico where we're also doctors and lawyers and firemen and we do all the other jobs. <laughs> and I, I can't tell you how much that does for your sense of self-worth. Um, it, it is, oh, we, it's, like the, it's like the little girl in the Blind Melon Bee video going to see all the other bees. Like, she's out of place everywhere, and they go, oh, we're all little in bee outfits over here. Um, that's what it felt like going to Puerto Rico. And I also, you know, I, I, I feel like I have a, a connection with my family, a connection with my roots. And also, you know, what it, it was, if Nina's central question is, I imagined what life would be if I'd grown up there, if my parents had stayed there instead of here. That was my glimpse of it every year for a month. When you were there, did you write? Yeah. What did you I, write? I wrote letters to my friends. I made movies. My, my grandfather was the general manager of the local credit union, and he would borrow the surveillance camera, and I would make movies with the surveillance camera. So I have movies, and in between the movies, you see footage of people online at the bank. Because those were the tapes I was taping over. Um, 
So I made lots of films, and my grandfather would bring home friends to be in the movies with me. A lot of animated movies of G.I. Joe's. Where are these movies, man? You've got to get these movies. <laughs> my Twitter followers know I have them. Um, and I've been digitizing them slowly, and they're terrible. Um, <laughs> But but they were how, you know they were how I, that were they were how a lonely kid keeps busy in Puerto Rico and I also wrote a lot of letters um, to my friends I, I I was a a really good pen pal in the summers even when in high school you, when were you happiest when you were leaving New York and going to Puerto Rico or when you were coming back Whew, that's a good question um, I I was always happy to come home um, you know again I'm a homebody uh, New York is my island at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> But at the same time, um, you know, it's not just being in Puerto Rico, it's being with your grandparents. Any of you who are lucky enough to have lived with your grandparents, you get spoiled rotten. Um, I ate Starbursts for dinner. Um, we'd go to, there's a, the, the biggest mall in Puerto Rico is in San Juan, and it was called Plaza Las America, and they had a thing called Time Out, which was the arcade, and the highlight of Puerto Rico, you know, people who don't know anything about Puerto Rico go like, so were you taking in wonderful culture, and going to the beaches, and learning about your roots? I was like, no, I was eating Starburst and playing video games all day. It was the best. <laughs> so you've been hanging with the Puerto Rican community here in Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. I, th what do you... What do you wish the people of Chicago knew about Puerto Rico that they don't presently know? Um, well, the lights have been off uh, for two days. They're just coming back. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think there's anything I could tell them that they don't already know. Um, one of the things that's been wonderful about this trip is my first time in Humboldt Park yesterday. Um, incredible. incredible. And as we were going there, my father, who has you know, been in... in politics and advocacy all my life, he said, I'm going to do a great impression of my father right now. Ling Manuel, the Puerto Ricans in Chicago did what New Yorkers could never manage to do. They said, this is our block, and they bought up all the businesses, and this is their block forever. <laughs> and there's a flag that marks the beginning of Division Street, and there's a flag that marks the end. And when you go through that town and you see, and that street, and you see all of the businesses have names that are towns in Puerto Rico. Um, you know, it's very weird to come to a city you've never been to before and feel instantly at home on the street. And that's how I felt in Humboldt Park. So you started riding Hamilton when you were at Wesleyan, right? And many of the people, some a couple of whom I just saw knocking around this very building, in yes. fact, are people with whom you started working when you were a... 18, 19 years old. So is the lesson for everybody here, stick with your, like, the people you know when you're 18 because those people are your best collaborators, <laughs> even when you become Lin-Manuel Miranda of Hamilton. <laughs> um, that, that, that title doesn't mean anything to me. Um, the, the, the lesson actually is if you find uh, collaborative partners who, who be believe in making the same stuff as you, hang on to them. Because it's very rare. Um, I had the great good fortune of meeting Tommy Kale the week after I graduated college. We actually didn't meet at Wesleyan. In fact, at Wesleyan, he just knew me by reputation as the pissant freshman who was borrowing his lights from his production for my 20-minute production of a musical I'd written. Um, so he was like, who is this freshman stealing my lights? Um, and uh, we met the week after I graduated. Um, Mutual friends had given him a, a CD and copy of my script for In the Heights, the college version, the 80-minute one act. Um, and the first three things he said to me were, um, well, In the Heights is a really good song, but it introduces your world, but it's the third song, it should be first. Usnavi's a really interesting character. He's only in the third scene. He's only in three scenes in the thing. It would be great if he could be the narrator, and that way all the stories filter through his bodega, and he can be the storyteller of the thing. Um, and at, at that speed... <laughs> And I thought, this guy's a lot smarter than me. <laughs> and two, um, I had two years distance from the show. I would put the show at my sophomore year, and I thought, this guy's going to make my show a lot better uh, than it would be if it were just me by myself. And, um, and that's a really important thing to be able to recognize, is to find the people who can make your work better. I will never play piano. I will never have the musical gifts of Alex Lacamoire. Um, he's, he's just got an incredible ear. 
It's like he was sent from heaven to help me work. You know, he's Cuban, he's got every Montuno pattern in his brain, but at the same time, he studied under Stephen Schwartz and was the associate conductor of Wicked when I met him. Um, so it was like he had the exact skill set uh, I needed. Um, so, it, you know, I felt very lucky that I found collaborators I trusted and, and you know, working with those people uh, as, because we have a shorthand now. So I, I remember talking to you when they hired you that they were updating Studs Terkel's working, right. consummate Chicago story. Um, and Studs had always written about blue collar professions. And you were hired, if I think, if I get this right, to write about working in McDonald's, which I believe you really did, correct? Yeah, that was my, yeah, was my first so, paying job. That was kind of a moment when you had working, a show about working, that was sort of, you were there to sort of say, this is what working is now. It's not just about being a grave digger or a book binder or something, it's about fast food. Well, <laughs> I, well actually, to be honest, um, when Stephen approached me, it wasn't with anything, Stephen Schwartz, uh, it wasn't with anything particularly in mind. It was just um, Gordon Greenberg's directing a new production, I think there's room for new songs in here. We'd love for you to do something. And so I listened to it. It's a great score. It's got some of the best songwriters alive who've contributed songs. Uh, Mickey Grant and Craig Cornelia and James Taylor, uh, the late, great Mary Rogers. Um, and they, he said, what, what do you think you could contribute? And I said, my first instinct um, is there's not really a my first job song. Um, what's your first job? And my first job was at McDonald's. On the, you the, McDo the counter, or you were making the burgers, or what were you doing? I had several shifts. Several, did you flip around? I did, I did the counter from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., so I was the one you yelled at when you were too late for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but can I just get an Egg McMuffin? I see it. I see it there behind the thing. Can you just give me that one? I'm sorry, it's, it's 11.10, we're serving lunch now. Yeah, but sometimes, yeah. I mean, sometimes they've not changed the menu, and that's really irritating when you can see the breakfast menu. Yes. And someone like you is there going. But. And I'm going, so I just work here, food. buddy. But um, the best thing about the job was we were the rare McDonald's that did delivery. Um, and with delivery, you make tips. Um, and when you're making 4.25 an hour, Tips are huge. Uh, so that's what my song's about. It's about the drudgery of the counter, which really like, gave me anxiety. Um, what and your anxieties working at Madonna? Oh, I mean, I, I caught a counterfeiter once. Um, I, <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of dead presidents, I caught a $20 bill with Washington's face on it <laughs> during the lunch rush <laughs> and said, this president's not supposed to be on a 20. And at that moment, you were like, Ten dollar Hamilton. Wait, a Wait, hold on a second. In Thirty years, I can have a good idea. Um, no, the um, but you know I, I, the anxiety of just you know getting it wrong and and having your register not add up at the end of the day. It had to add up within two dollars, otherwise your pay was docked. Um, so you know that that's stressful. But delivery was free. Delivery, you're walking around, you're in your outfit. I was 14, so I'd see like girls in summer school, and I'd be like, Hey, how are you? I, I wasn't really. Um, and I smelled like burgers. Um, <laughs> but that was, that was the freeing part of the job. And so that song was, was about that. So then I, then I encountered you working on a musical called Bring It On. Bring It On. A version, <laughs> a version of the movie, that they, the 2000 movie with Kirsten Dunst, which I remember seeing in Atlanta, actually. And the thing about that, mu that particular musical, it was interesting because you were using cheerleading, but there were some interesting, unconventional, I think, rhythmic kind of things that you were doing that I'm thinking maybe informed the musical that followed them a little bit. Absolutely. You know, um, when I was a child dreaming of a life in musical theater, Bring It On was never a thing I aspired to. <laughs> and yet, and yet... Um, Andy Blankenbuehler approached me. He said, um, I don't have the rights to the first movie. I have the rights to the title. And I said, I'm not interested in doing an adaptation of a movie. Uh, and he said, it's not an adaptation of any of the movies. Jeff Witte has an idea. And as soon as he said Jeff Witte has an idea, I was interested. Because Jeff Witte is an incredible writer. He wrote the book to Avenue Q. Um, he's one of the funniest writers we have in the theater. Um, and he said, I want to do all about Eve with cheerleaders. And I said, ooh. 
that's interesting. I said, but I don't know that I could write the whole score. He said, I don't want you to write the whole score. I want you to write it with Tom Kitt. And I went, oh. <laughs> um, and, and, and it underlines a very important point, which is we write musicals, and one out of five shows that reaches Broadway makes its money back. That's a four out of five failure rate in terms of seeing a return on your investment. So, what is the lesson you take away from that? You cannot do something because you think it will make money. You cannot do it because you, you know, it's just, it's a bad investment. Um, you have to do it because you believe in it, and you have to do it because you love it. Or you have to do it because you believe you will learn from it. Now, I knew I wanted to be in the room when Andy Blankenbuehler was choreographing cheerleaders. <laughs> I wanted to see what an Andy Blankenbuehler cheerleading routine would look like. Um, so to that end, um, one of the things I learned very quickly was that Andy had the whole show in his head already. Uh, even though we hadn't written the songs and we hadn't written the book, he saw a rise and a fall and the energy shifts of it. And he would say to me things like, when they come in, it's got to have a rhythm of And I would go, and I'm like, I literally copy the tempo, he yelled at me. Um, I'd write backwards from the beat and the rhythm he had in his head, and then I'd play it for him. He'd go, wow, that beat is great. Where did you get that? <laughs> and I, like the, the, the kid in the drug ads from the 80s, would go, you all right? I got it from watching you. <laughs> um, so how, did, how did you use that in? <laughs> <laughs> That's a deep cut. You kids don't know what I'm talking about. How did you use that in Hamilton? So what have, what have cheerleaders got to do with Hamilton musically, rhythmically? Um, the, the, the biggest uh, lesson we got from Bring It On was, you know, if you ever see a cheerleading routine, and please do, go turn on ESPN. They're the craziest things you'll ever see in your life. Um, it's like teenagers, but somehow even more caffeinated. And the music is this incredible dance electronic music. It's oots, 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 oots. So how do you write lyrics over that? Um, how do you tell a story over that kind of energy? And so what we kind of had to do by trial and error was write the kind of song that would not feel out of place in a real cheerleading routine, but also told the story um, of what these cheerleaders were going through in real time. And so it was a lot of, and this is logistical, but it helped us a lot, how much do you pre-record and how much do you play live? And we pre-recorded a lot on Bring It On and found that the sound was always an issue. Um, mixing live instruments and pre-recorded instruments is always sort of a weird wash. And so by the time we'd come to Hamilton, Alex said, I, knew exact, I know exactly how I want to arrange this. This is a rock band with a string quartet, and we're going to play all of the sounds, even if it's a sound I made in a demo, and it was a loop I found in Logic or uh, Final Cut. Um, there's a drummer on a pad playing it live. Um, so even in Satisfied, the boots, um, there's a drummer playing that live. It's not a pre-recorded beat. Um, everything's played live. Um, the only pre-recorded thing in our whole show is the collage uh, that accompanies the Satisfied Rewind. Um, when Satisfied presses Rewind, all the, all the players put down their violins and cellos for a second, and we play this thing that Nevin Steinberg worked for days on, um, and if there were justice in the world, there would be a sound design Tony, and he would have a Tony for it, um, that sort of rewinds the previous 10 minutes on stage and then takes us back to the beginning of the love story. Something I've always wanted to ask you, I'm going to ask you now. Um, the day of triumph for Hamilton, the Tony Day, Orlando happened. And you came out. I'm very curious what that day was like, the first thing. And then, you know, in newspapers, we always laugh at award shows. We sit there going, shut up, get off, enough, thank you. Yes, I did do right? We're a little, re we're a tad irreverent, you might say. And you came out and you said, love is love is love is love. <laughs> And I, I remember thinking, and I, I'm not blowing smoke, I'm really not, I remember thinking, how did he manage that? How did he, how did he perfectly encapsulate what everybody was feeling at that moment and what the theater, you get Verklempt talking about it, what the theater represents to people in moments like that? And here was your day, and that was what you were faced with. And I thought it was one of the most admirable things I've ever seen anybody do.
at a, at a talk show. And so, well, how did you come up with that, Lynn? Um, you know, here's the reality. I, I woke up that morning at 6 a.m. Uh, we went to the, to the Beacon Theater at 7 a.m. It really was the Hamiltonies that year. We were in like five things. So I had to be there first thing in the morning. We had to rehearse the opening number, which my cast appeared in and which I appeared in. We had the interstitial because we convinced them that we should do like a ham for ham type thing on the bumpers to commercials. So I had to rehearse with Steve Martin and Andrew Lloyd Webber. I had to um, rehearse uh, our actual number. Uh, the, the, the world turned upside down into Yorktown. And um, we had, in case we won, we were going to perform the Schuyler Sisters for the, the closing ceremony. So we had to very superstitiously, secretly rehearse that as well. So I'm basically in show mode from 7 a.m. to about 1 p.m. all day. Don't really even have time to look at my phone. I'm in costume. Um, I hear the news as I'm leaving the theater. I, I, I pick up my, my phone and, and read what's happened. Um, the reason it was in my thoughts is that I, I hadn't written a speech. I hadn't written an acceptance speech for anything. I thought, all right, I'll have between 2 p.m. and the end of the day to write whatever thoughts are in my head, and sort of that'll be what I bring to the podium if I'm lucky enough to win. And then this thing happens. The worst shooting tragedy in our nation's history. And the victims are all Puerto Rican, and they're all... Um, you know, it's in a gay club, and, um, you know, the theater community doesn't exist without the gay community. It is, it is, they're the same thing. Um, and the first thing I get is a phone call from Tommy Kale saying, I don't, I don't want to be doing a number where we're waving around guns tonight. So we take all the guns out of Yorktown. Um, just because that's not the, the image we wanted to send into the world that night. Um, and then I'm alone with my thoughts, and I knew I was, I was thinking about my wife, I was thinking about my child, and I could not stop thinking about what had happened that day. And it's sort of, um, it's sort of when you're, um, I don't want to say this in a way that sounds wrong. My job is to musicalize moments and meet the moment as honestly as I can. Um, and sometimes the moment is presented to you in real time. And so I, I, I couldn't imagine freestyling about this. Um, I, I needed to look for some kind of different form to express it. Um, and so I thought, okay, um, this was going to be a love sonnet to my wife, but it's going to have to be about more than that. Um, and so that's sort of what happened. And I had written love is love on there. That's a phrase that's been, that's been constant throughout the LGBT community. That's not a new phrase. Um, but then I just kind of felt myself pounding it home as I was saying it um, because it was um, almost as an incantation uh, against the morning. And, and, and that's, that's all I can say is um, when, you, when you write musicals, you're trying to meet the moment honestly. And, and I, I felt like I had a duty to meet the moment as honestly as I could with what I had in me. How are you all doing? Are you needing to rush off or should we keep going for a little bit? We keep going? All right, so, so we could like try some freestyle type thing. No, I <laughs> Chris Jones, as you know, I have a rule that if a reporter asks me to freestyle, they must beatbox. <laughs> you gotta have skin in the game to stay in the game. If I'm going to maybe look like an idiot, you're coming with me. All right. So wait, what's the... Wait. What's the... There's um, no idea. What's the topic here? <laughs> no idea. Okay, wait. Wait. Just wait. Just everyone stay where you are for just a second. So I'm going to play President thing. Obama right here. Okay. Except, by the way, he, you know, he had like a military drummer to do the beat. Right. FYI. So now I've got to hold the microphone. I'm going to put the cards here. Can you all I'm see? not going to look. 
<laughs> I haven't seen these. This is not a bit. He has no idea. I'd like to address my sons and apologize for the future embarrassment this is going to cause. I know at middle school this isn't going to go down well on YouTube, and I'm, I'm really oh. sorry. I'm really sorry. At last, my right arm is complete again! All right, so I'm just going to do a pathetic sort of beat here, and then you, are, and I'm going to pull out. These are, the, this is the common theme. The common theme is Chicago. Yeah. Are we ready? Okay. Waka, 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 waka. Uh. He's even got the brakes. Chris Jones has got what it takes. All right, well, I won't be a liar, so let's freestyle about the great Chicago fire. Oh, uh, what's it mean to me? I watched the Chicago show Chicago PD, and yeah, I ain't famous, but I used to know that girl like Monica Raymond. Oh, Chicago theater is so pretty. Don't know why y'all call yourself the second city, uh, cause you're first in my eyes. Uh, waka 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 waka. <laughs> waka waka. Ah, uh, yeah. So I'm freestyling and I put it in the air. <laughs> Meet my beatboxer, my man's Fozzie Bear. The Blues, the Blues Brothers, you know you love us. You gotta talk about the Blues Blues Brothers. And yes, Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi. They rap so well, make me shake my tushy. Uh, we gotta talk about cubbies, oh yeah. So wives kiss on your hubbies, and oh my gosh, if it gets from bad to worse, I hope y'all list that century curse. Hope y'all win the pennant. I'm winning the second city. I'm not writing this by committee. I'm writing this <laughs> off the top of the dome. And Chris Jones, waka waka, makes me feel at home. Waka, waka. Yeah, we got the Michael Jordan. Oh, yeah, I wish this was being recorded. Cause you know that when it comes to me, I'm styling free. I'm like Mr. Number 23. If you wanna. Windy City, my name is Michelle Obama. Oh yeah, and I'm going from like table to farm and I wish I had her arms. <laughs> Chance the Rapper, tomorrow night. Color and book, out of sight. Yeah, one of the Windy City's finest. I wish I could go you and chill in that climate. Ah, oh, yeah, my name is Lin Manuel. That is Rahm Emanuel. Yes, you know him very well. Yes, he is your mayor, and his brother is Ari Emanuel, who is also quite a player. Ah, oh, Oprah. Yes, that is right. That's what I'll show you. Oprah Winfrey, look where you are, cause you get a car. You get a car. You get a car. Ah. Okay, you got the thick crust. I will rap about this if I must. It's so nice to meet you. I want to take a bite into you like a fucking deep dish pizza. <laughs> Let me know up, Miranda. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> now we come to the uh, interactive portion of the evening, so <laughs> you'll never forget that moment, uh, and neither will I. So uh, we, some of you filled out cards, and Morgan Green uh, from the trip is going to walk right out here with these. Say hello to Morgan, everybody. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we, I kind of get bored in Q&A, so here's my, here's my suggestion. My suggestion is we do a lot of people's questions, we do it fast. Great. You're up for that? Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. What advice would you give to young actors aspiring to revolutionize Broadway? Start by getting a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the glib answer. The real answer is you have to treat auditioning like the job. Treat auditioning as, as the thing you're preparing for and the thing you're gonna learn from so that getting the job is gravy. And then get another job that pays the rent until then. What is your favorite time or era in history or other historical figure? And P.S. if you're reading this, I love you. 
I love you too, Chris. That's the question. Not, no, I understand. not me, necessarily. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, you know, I've, I've read about a lot of different eras. I wouldn't trade 2016 for the world. Uh, we live in really interesting times, and, um, and, and I'm glad I'm, I'm alive for them. If you could have breakfast with one person in the world, alive or dead, who would it be and why? Jesus in a large group of people. <laughs> I hear he was a very dynamic guy, and if we need seconds, I know he'd provide. <laughs> if you were to write another musical about a historical, if you were to write another musical about a historical figure, who would it be? But wait, the questioner has suggestions. Eleanor Roosevelt, Queen Elizabeth, anybody. really covering your ass with the third one. Um, of, the, of those two... Female, there is a female. Yeah, of those two, Eleanor Roosevelt is by far more interesting to me. Um, you know, incredible, powerful husband. She also is incredibly powerful in her own right. She's got that apartment with the lady in New York. Um, she got her girlfriend on the side. She's got a side chick. There's a musical there. When you were doing Hamilton, what was the single... Funniest, a.k.a. weirdest thing that happened during that... This is a good question. During the process of Hamilton, what was that? The weird, there must have been some moments that were just weird, wackadoodle, bizarre, strange. There was a day when <laughs> Seth Stewart sat on a chair like any other day, and it splintered underneath him <laughs> so hard. I was actually on the second level. You know, it's a two-level set. and I've, It was like out of a cartoon. Um, he went and sat in that chair, and he's supposed to be watching a cabinet battle, and the thing exploded like it was rigged. Um, and I will cherish that memory of, of Seth Stewart ass over tea kettle for the rest of my life. What keeps you up at night? Twitter. <laughs> if you could bring three things to an island, what would they be? A power source, Puerto Rico. Um, I'd bring a power source. I'd bring a device on which to listen to music. And I would bring my hard drive and my collection of music. And I'd, that, that's what I couldn't live without. Do you have any advice for a young playwright who has been advised to get a real job and only do his writing on the side? Good advice. <laughs> only, only in that it's practical. But here's the thing. You, you have to do what you love. If, if we weren't sitting here and we weren't talking, I would still be writing musicals. I would just be writing musicals as a substitute teacher at Hunter College High School. Um, so pay your rent. Um, cover your nut. You know, get health insurance. But at the same time, do what you love. And don't let anyone stop you. If you could play any other role in Hamilton, what would that role be? Angelica. Angelica. It's the best song in the show. Any chance of you playing it? Uh, not in Tommy's version. The outfits don't fit me. Um, but hey, somewhere down the line, someone will let me. Um, okay, this Ariana asked this question. Is it, it has been evident. That's a great way to start a question. It has been evident that smart people come to the Hamilton Lin Manuel Miranda event. It has been evident that you're one of those people whose brain is constantly working and constantly thinking. How do you shut down your brain and just relax every once in a while? How do you do that? It's a great question. It is a great question. Um, I, I, again, music saves my life. My family saves my life a lot. Um, my wife's the most extraordinary person I know. Um, and she doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't care what ideas in my head if the trash isn't out and <laughs> if, if Sebastian needs a diaper change. Um, and, and you need that. You need the people who keep you honest and keep you grounded. And, um, you know, this entire time that Hamilton's been happening and, and the world has taken notice of it, we've been raising a child together and that keeps you humble. And it's the hardest video game you've ever played. <laughs> the second 
you're good at swaddling doesn't need swaddling. <laughs> the second you can mix formula with one hand onto solids. The second you've got the crawling figured out onto walking, it's like it never lets you get comfortable, ever. Um, he's growing faster than I can possibly imagine it, and you want to slow down time, and you want to cherish it, um, and, and so that's, that's the great so, so, humbler so, of my life. So you walk around all day, everyone kisses your ass, it's Lin Manuel Miranda, or we saw, and then you go home, and she's not interested in any of that, I'm Yeah, I mean, she's nice to me. I don't want to make her sound mean. She <laughs> is my wife and loves me. Uh, she's really great, but, but at the same time, yeah, we're, we're doing our own thing. We have, we have a different set of concerns when we get home. Um, and and that's that's important. What song are you currently obsessed with? Oh, there's a song on Watsky's new album called "Don't Be Nice." Um, there's Watsky right there, um, <laughs> and it's he changes the meter like midway through the song, and it's thrilling. That's all I'll say. Go download it. What was your favorite part of filming Drunk History? And can you share any insights about the upcoming Hamilton episode? Says Emily. <laughs> My favorite part was that it even happened. I'm a huge fan of that show. Um, and uh, the, the fun of it was, it was actually, I don't remember a ton about the film. <laughs> Which is kind of the point. I'm as curious to see it as the rest of you. Um, <laughs> but I got calls from a lot of friends the next day saying, do you even remember talking to me? <laughs> and I said, vaguely, what did I say? Um, I remember. <laughs> Jonathan Groff, I FaceTime Jonathan Groff. Um, <laughs> like your name. And okay, I just, just hold it, hold it there for one time. I forgot to ask this. That song, you know, You'll Be Back. Yeah. Give me two seconds on how you came up with that, because it's, it's, it's a distinctive song. Well, it's, um, it's a literal British invasion era song right. for a literal British invasion. <laughs> um, and, and so for me, the fun of it was to write a breakup letter, to, to have the king think of, and, and I was nudged along this path actually by the John Adams documentary. Um, when John Adams, there's a great scene in the John Adams uh, miniseries where John Adams meets with King George, and King George is sort of standing in the corner, and he doesn't know whether to address him as another head of state or not, and he's just sort of like, good luck, motherfuckers. <laughs> like, it's, it feels very personal, even though he's addressing the head of a country. And so I thought, okay, well, let's extend that. Let's make this a breakup letter to the colonies. Okay. Um, but it's a really dysfunctional relationship. Like, I'm going to, it's, you know, if this were an actual relationship to a romantic partner, it would be an Eminem song. It would be, it would be, you can't live without me, I love you, I'm going to, you know, hurt you until you come back. Um, and, um, and so it was fun playing with that. How did you get that? Da, 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 da. You know, it's one of the only songs I wrote without an instrument uh, anywhere near me. I, I wrote most of the lyrics on my honeymoon. Um, I was on an island without any access to electricity or anything, and I just had to, the tune had to be so catchy that it survived me being without a piano for two weeks and stayed in my head until I got home. So I wrote down the lyrics, and the da, da, da helped me keep it catchy. When you're casting actors in the show, what do you look for in the people who try out? Um, that you can sing and act and dance, <laughs> number one. But, but I'll tell you something really important that Tommy looks for, and he really looks for uh, a positive energy. It's not unlike what, when Lorne Michaels is sussing out sort of cast members for Saturday Night Live. He, he has this thing like, you've got to know that you're going to be around this person at three in the morning uh, in a building when it's dark and lonely and everything's going to be okay. So he tries to cast good people. Um, so uh, if you're talented but the energy is, in the audition room is one of entitlement or you're not all there or there's just, there's something going on, Tommy's going to be wary about casting you. He wants to cast people with great energy who are collaborators, who know they tell the story. Tommy knows he goes away. Uh, at a certain point, and it's the, in theater, unlike any other medium, the actors are in charge of telling the story night to night. It's the most empowering thing you can have. So we cast people we want to spend eight times a week with. If you could use the, disco the discogra discography of one hip-hop artist to create a new jukebox musical, who would you pick? Great question. I don't know that I want to reveal the answer to that. What if I want to really do it? 
Um, <laughs> I can tell you some that would be great. Um, Biggie has some of the best storytelling in hip hop. Eminem has more characters than any other rapper. Um, Jay Z's arc is, I mean, both business moguls and, and kids, uh, teenagers listen to that because it is the most aspirational music you could listen to. Um, so those are three great candidates uh, right there. And, they, and by, by virtue of the careers of the artists involved, they, there's, an, there's, a, there's an arc. There's an arc of a rise and a fall and a rise again. So those are three off the top of my head. Are you going to the Chance concert tomorrow night? I can't. You've got a show to do. No, I'm going home. Um, I'm going home to New York for the weekend, and then I'll be back on, on Monday. You know, I, um, that's, I, I, I have a babysitter during the days of the week, and when I'm home, it's my kid time on the weekend. So All I'm right. going home to be with my kid, and then I'll be back on Monday. <laughs> you don't have to that. You're supposed to be home with your kids. Sarah Newcomb asks you this question. Would you ever consider casting a disabled person in Hamilton? Absolutely. Do you think Hamilton would have made a great president? I don't know. Um, there are certainly issues of temperament. <laughs> well, it would think, not be unique there. I think, I think, I think, um, the presidency is a revealer of who you are. You don't become less yourself, you become more yourself. Um, George Washington was very obsessed with his legacy. He calcified over the course of his eight years. He became more statuesque, more aware of the burden of history as first president. Um, I think you become more yourself. And so the, the things you look for are, are, are temperament. So think about who has the best temperament. <laughs> <laughs> Temperament. <laughs> Temperament 2016. <laughs> if Hamilton were turned into a movie, I'm going to change that to when Hamilton is turned into a movie. 2035. Would you consider starring in it? It depends when it happens. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty close to making an In the Heights movie happen. Um, <laughs> I've said that before. <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. I'm now jaded and bitter about it. Um, but but it's, it's close, and Kiara's writing a new screenplay, and we have producers and, and uh, a director in John M. Chu, uh, who's an incredible filmmaker. He made the Step Up movies. Um, and though I went and saw all of those in the theater. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, that being said, I'm not playing Usnavi in that movie. I'm too old. Um, so it depends. If it, if it comes along at a time when I'm still young enough to be able to carry the arc of the guy's life, I'd love to do it. If not, I'll be over here making new shit. Question from me. <laughs> Question from me, would you consider a career in politics yourself? I would rather... <laughs> I would rather listen to a four-hour recording of your beatboxing than, <laughs> than run for office. <laughs> I would rather... I would rather do almost anything than run for public office. I, 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 my dad runs campaigns. I know what's involved. I've seen how the sausage gets made. I'm not interested in any part of that life. If New York is the greatest city in the world, is Chicago the second greatest city in the world? <laughs> Can I say something? <laughs> so I did like 300 interviews for you guys yesterday, and every reporter asked me, why did you bring Hamilton to Chicago? Why is that the next stop? What's with your complex? <laughs> and, I would say, and I would say to them, guys, you're Chicago. Like, you're home of Lori Metcalf and Jesse Mueller and Steppenwolf and a million, a million, a million brilliant theater practitioners. Where else would we go? So I know you call yourselves the second city, but you're pretty freaking fantastic. That's all I'm going to say about that. Well, I would say this, that right now, Lin-Manuel, Chicago is your town. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lin-Manuel Miranda! Yeah!